Welcome back, everybody, to your daily update on the state of, um, I don't know, lots of people dying in this case. Um, we're back with uh, the final ramblings on Dust of Dreams, book three. Yes, I finished it earlier today, and um, this is probably going to be a quick one because there's a lot of action and not that much, um, like, other stuff. I mean, there's still a lot of other stuff going on, but I figured um, I'm not sure how much, you know, I can say about all these things because my mind is scattered as always. Anyway, let's just go and do this. Cheers. All right. So, chapter 17 and 18, and yes, it's brutal, and a lot of it uh, we spend with um, the Bargast, who get what they deserve, or something like that. And also the Acrini. Um, they maybe don't deserve it, but notions of justice, as we learned, are somewhat problematic, right? Anyway, I feel like the more interesting discussion, apart from you know, the, 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 that final battle where a lot of people die is the, inter, are the interactions between, um, in this case, um, Bacal and, um, I already forgot her name, which, you know, is, is part of the problem here. <laughs> um, the, uh, the woman he saved because, um, you know, like his wife and, um, her husband wanted to kill her and Bacal. And when they talk about the idea of the hobbling and the the eternal question of why um, people do such a thing and why women do such a thing and the argument put forth by her, and I, yeah, I unfortunately can't remember her name right now. It's something with S, it starts with S, but I don't know the rant. It's, Never mind. Um, argument is that um, banding together and pushing, yeah, banding together and basically pushing one one woman to the wolves, throwing one woman to the wolves. In this case, the main, uh, the ma uh, the men, um, with the hobbling, basically saves uh, them, and so that the like the viciousness of women towards one woman, the singling out and so forth, um, is basically a result of domestic violence and general um, um, uh, abuse of uh, women within that bargast society, which we have to take as truth uh, when it comes to the bargast. I'm pretty sure that, you know, we have to take that as red anyway. But the interesting point there is, is that something that we, and it's interesting that like when they're talking about it, that Bacal then realized that yes, she is right about this, is that there is a lot of like domestic violence and other degrading um, behavior of men towards women within Bargas society. When we now take that and look at our own world and our own world we use and our own society and um, how we as men, a lot of men at least, uh, treat women consciously or oftentimes unconsciously um, in a degrading way or in like a humili way, hum humiliating way or just a shitty way, right? It's just like something that is still very much ingrained within um, large swaths of societies, different societies, different cultures, right? This is not just an Eastern or Western or whatever problem. Like In almost all patriarchies or former patriarchies, we as men still behave like dickheads like 90% of the time. At least when we're not consciously trying not to. And that's, I guess, that's sort of the problem that you can take away from that is like um, that we may not consciously, you know, be conscious of um, being dickheads towards women. 
but it's certainly something that when we're not thinking about, we we say things or we act in certain ways that can still be, uh, you know, threatening or at least uncomfortable and so forth. And the question that is, is that like overall like um, behavior, that overall experience that a lot of women still have in our society, most women, I guess, still have in our society, that constant climate of hostility and threat is that what drives them to, you know, actually band together and push, like, some women towards their, you know, um, they, you know, band together and fall on some other women? Is that where this, like, is that the mechanism behind it? I mean, I'm not, I'm not a sociologist. But I feel there is, there could be some truth to that. I don't know. Um... As I said, it's something that we, for like the bar guests, we kind of need to take it as truth because that's a fictional world. But I feel there is probably some truth to it. And I guess the only option there is to try and be aware of the fact and try not to do these things. And if you realize that you have done something dumb, then I don't know, go and uh, try to do better next time and apologize if apologies are possible. Um... That, once again, I guess, is like the other big issue there, which, you know, harkens back to that image of the um, of the kill site that we had at the beginning of book three. Was it the beginning of book three? I think it was at the beginning of book three, maybe even the ending of book two. That point where um, Tool walks there and, like, ruminates on that whole idea of, like, having that herd of buffalo, or, like, or in this case, Rennick, or any other like huge animals and driving them down that drive so they fall over the cliff and die and having that uh, that you know and this once again i said is is that image that we um have to uh, like for for the bar guest as well and probably also for a human society that it, changing things getting you know um getting rid of traditions because they are usually problematic is um is very very difficult but it's also very necessary because otherwise you will it will just lead a society into self-destruction which is what happens within um these chapters right the bar guests are basically are basically um uh, confronting the uh Akrinai and the drafts and all of the others and they like if you know uh, certain um, mother darks wouldn't show up to <laughs> or like return and thus um, you know do all these things that happen and like everyone dies um, they would win that battle because they're well armed they're more civilized uh, they're more like disciplined they in the end they would win that battle maybe not like really well but they would still win that battle um, and the entire Bargast would be destroyed. Now, in this case, the Sinan actually try to change, and by this I mean just, you know, turn around and just walk away. Which is pretty good. I mean, <laughs> gives them a chance. I don't know if they're still alive or if they also were still caught in that um, descent of Draconis. Which is, I guess, the other important bit there. Draconis is back. That gives us, like, a small hint on the timing. So this is basically... The, we're now at the same time as we were at the ending of Toll the Hounds, right? And that will be... Just so you, uh, like, you know, for the, like, overarching timeline, which I always struggle with, but these kinds of events are, I guess, pretty easy to pinpoint. Um. So, yeah. That whole idea of, um, like, um, violent, um, problematic behavior of women towards women being the result of um, general sexism and misogyny, in a way. Thought, thoughtless misogyny, mostly, I guess, in this case, um, is something that I feel is one of the, like, important lessons to take away from, from these chapters. There's obviously more of them. Now let's try and look at some of the others there.
I mean, there's like some of the conversation between um, Tool and um, not a Tool. <clears throat> Although this is gonna be like the next thing, the assembling of an entire Talani mass army, following Tool, who is apparently out to get everyone, maybe because Olar Ithil tries to get that done or not, is once again an important thing going on here. Um, um, because, yeah, that's sort of the revenge of the Talani Mass against humanity, who, as we learned, killed the Talani Mass. Um, now, um, will that succeed or not? I cannot say yet. Um, but I feel the, the image of, like, our past coming back to haunt us or to destroy us, like, the, the our past sins coming back to actually violently destroy us, is once again something that I feel comes, is, a, is an important part of, um, how to say, of um, later parts of the Malaz and Book of the Fallen. And I do have some thoughts on that matter that I will try to explain in a separate video once I am done with um, the Crippled God, because like there's still aspects that I need to re reread on that topic. Um, and the other <laughs> big one I feel is um, what's going on with Icarium, and I'm still kind of trying to figure out it. Like this is. I don't know, I guess we'll never really find out. Is this basically Ikarium as a person wandered there? Um, and um, all the things about these different people, which, you know, Feather Witch and Rotos Hivana and uh, Texilian and all these others, were those all in his head, including Tarolak Veed? <laughs> or, and he just imagined all of that. He basically just lost, like, his personality just cracked because of who he is. Or were they the actual people, or in whatever way did his actual, like, physical form change into these different people? That's sort of the question that I, I still can't answer. <clears throat> Although I do kind of appreciate the idea of him basically like if all of that happens in his like in his head that him basically one after the other murdering or murdering these different personalities within himself on this painful return to him to himself as an image but also you know he now does have a um change mouth fortress which is pretty cool, I would say. So yeah, there's there's that thing going on. Also, it's really interesting to figure out what is going on with Badal. With um, her apparently dreaming things and being in visions, or having visions, and in those actually seeing what happens to Hetan and uh, Kafal. <laughs> And, um, yeah, I don't know how that works, but it's, um, it's certainly, it adds like pathos to that whole, whole situation with Kafal and Hetan and, um, how those who tried to, um, how those who tried to change, to change the bar gas, take them away from their course of self-destruction, how those die in the most random stupid ways and how they just you know that's that's i guess the other lesson that you can take from this is like this all starts with humbral tor just drowning because he had his stupid traditional coin hauberk on and which in itself obviously is a powerful image for how tradition can weigh you down and destroy you as a society <laughs> if you take that whole like Coin Holberg and him just drowning randomly, right? And that just that all precipitating that whole like destruction of the Bargast, which once again like brings up that like the influence that random chance can actually play in the fate or like if fate's the right word of, of a society, of culture. Just like, yeah, maybe. If that hadn't happened, then 
things would have been completely different. Or maybe if Kafal would have stood like two meters to the left, those like <laughs> like sentries wouldn't have found him and killed him, or you know, all these like dumb things that happen. The other I guess um thing that is interesting is the description of that last night, that frenzy that frenzy of the Bargas that's trying even further to, you know, dig deeper into tradition. I guess that's that's I guess the other side of this is like how like tradition is um so um like digging further into the past will become more and more frenzied the uh, like the, the deeper you dig in a way and that that is the wrong wrong way to go uh plus obviously you have people like Meral Ebb and um uh, Sikara the Vile who are just like individually greedy people and has that beautiful quote that um <laughs> there was uh, greed is the knife sheathed in ambition something like that um so, um, yeah, there's that. What else? I really enjoy the conversation between Tuck and the Jackhead. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's just fun when he talks about them meeting the, um, <laughs> meeting the Talani mass and how they would appreciate that because <laughs> for reasons of nostalgia. That, that conversation in general is very much fun. I need more Jack Hut stuff in my life. That's just, I don't know. I will read Carcanus, I guess. <laughs> anyway, um, there's that. What else? Yes, Mother Dark returns to Carcanus. <clears throat> and we learn really weird things about the Sheikh at the first show. Like this, like the, the world building and lore shit going on in these two cap chapters is once again impressive because yes um, so the shake came from Carcanas originally and they were living between light the fall of light and uh, darkness and uh, were not just like human but apparently um, like th their relationship to the Tist Edor, Edor is like really interesting also, apparently, that it is Silchas Ruin who was the last one who commanded Galan to create the road for the Sheikh. Which, yeah, Silchas Ruin is probably my favorite of those three brothers so far. I'm not sure if that will like be the same after I've read Carcanas, but so far, Silchas Ruin, in his like um, irrationality, in his um, overall approach, like seems to be uh, he's more like my my type of tis dandy also he's you know not as you know uh, pompous as um uh, anamander rake which i guess is the advantage of you being you know buried in the ground for thousands of years and not having to actually become more and more pompous and powerful um but yeah so that conversation with, um, and I feel this is the other side, like there with, um, with um, that conversation with uh, Twilight and the Watch. And like, not so much the conversation, but her thoughts on the matter of her having to question everything and the Watch being the one who's like always certain about everything. <laughs> that echoes that whole idea of like opposites like those polar opposites being necessary to hold something up to uh, create choice to create um existence in a way light dark certainty uncertainty like these things which you know once again is this uh thing that i hopefully mentioned before that um steven erickson is really good at like having these themes like just come up in the like seemingly most insignificant moments once again and again like reinforcing these themes and ideas within the story what else uh 
I still find these uh, scenes with the snake and Badal and um, Rut really, I don't know. They read like some weird fever dream and are super depressing, obviously. Like the, the, the way you see how those people are growing older, right? Like how Badal becomes more and more cynical in what she does. And it's like, yeah, yeah I know that these... Things are not true, but I will not say that to you, Rut, because we need you to go on. How calculating and so forth she becomes through necessity, obviously. Which, once again, I mean, the whole thing there is to see the inter like the terrible crime it is to leave children behind or like do anything like to to children. Which, yeah, I guess we kind of know. Um, what else was there? I mean, this is rather scatterbrained today. I'm sorry about that. Um, but I, I don't know. I had better ideas earlier today and then I didn't have time to record the video. <laughs> but, um, I feel that, yes, as I said, like the most interesting bits are that war, that whole like build up to that whole final thing there. That's, ah, that's like the other thing there. Um, Nature, when it comes to destroy, in this case, it's Mother Dark returning and just, uh, or Draconis in this uh, case, showing up with all the power of Corral Galen behind him and freezing the entire plane there and killing everyone indiscriminately is once again one of these moments where we realize that while they're like that ideas of justice are just ridiculous sometimes when it comes to dying because nature doesn't care. It's like us from the outside who try to impose meaning on it, right? We try to explain or like put things that happen into a narrative. And those narratives need ideas of justice and injustice and so forth. But the forces of nature just don't care. They just kill indiscriminately. And um, that, I feel, is sort of the other side of this that we should... Well, that it helps to keep aware, like in mind, and that Steven Erickson sometimes, you know, is very good at showing us. Like sometimes these things just happen, and um, it they kill good and bad people at the same time, which you know, it's kind of depressing. Um, but yeah, this has been rather a short one. I'll be back tomorrow, however, when we start the final book of Dust of Dreams. And, um, well, I kind of know what's coming up, so I'm excited. <laughs> and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Until then, have a great Tuesday night. Cheers.